Hello and welcome to Midweek Matters. It was a welcome announcement. The Prime Minister's Monday announcement that the centre will procure vaccines and give it to states for free. It signals a change of heart. The PM and the ruling dispensation would not like the decision to be seen as taken under pressure from the public opinion or the Supreme Court, even if it was. But let's not try to score points here. It is a good decision. Wisdom dawned at last. Let's hope that even the 25% for the private hospitals is also done away with. Let us have a 100% free universal vaccination. Can we hope for another evening announcement soon? Moving forward, Today, I want to speak about three things. How the government's thinking is mired in the past, how its actions are messing with the present, and how muddled it is about the way forward. The government and the ruling dispensation seem to be in the grip of a shamanic worldview. The way they understood the COVID menace, the kind of prescriptions they proffered and encouraged leave us in no doubt about it. This seems to be the main reason for the union government's unpreparedness and premature triumphalism. The country had to pay a heavy price for the mess that it was led into by the government. It caused thoughtless, harsh lockdown when the cases were small in number and municipalization of restrictions when the death toll breached world record and now uncoordinated easing. The country had to suffer lacks of avoidable tragic deaths, breakdown of medical infrastructure, vaccine unavailability, chaos in its procurement, massive job losses, severe contraction of economy. The ruling dispensation seems to have no clue about the way forward for the country. I try to look for any hints that the government or its think tank set up to provide ideas to transform India, the Niti Aayog, are mapping out future scenarios and putting together position papers on the way forward. The Aayog's portal has a blog posted in March this year by its CEO. Its title was Promising, Preparing for a Post-Pandemic Economy. But alas, it talked about e-mobility, next generation batteries, artificial intelligence and 5G technologies, not the bread and butter issues that afflict the marginal and vulnerable today or into the next few years. Its vice chairman radiated optimism about the future in his address to the Golden Jubilee of the Department of Science and Technology, but has not mapped out any clear scenarios. In a presentation to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Finance, the IOG's team forecast a drastic change in the world economic order from unipolar to bipolar with a very high degree of uncertainty along with a rise in poverty, unemployment and debt. It stated that the global economy could spiral into two extreme ways, the more probable scenario resembling the Great Depression of the 1930s and a rather slim chance of a repeat of the post-World War I roaring 1920s. The IOG, however, did not give any specific details about the current economic situation in India. It was reported that the Parliamentary Standing Committee expressed its dissatisfaction with the presentation. The members wanted the IOG to chalk out an economic recovery path for India and also give them an idea of the other countries' paths. The members were right. That's what is expected of the IOG. I have also not come across any efforts by our public universities 
to construct probable post-pandemic scenarios for our country. I tried to search as much as I could. I couldn't find any studies. I also contacted about 20 academics from across the country to find out if their universities or anyone known to them did any work in this field. I have not received a single affirmative answer. For those who are not familiar with the construction of future scenarios, let me explain it briefly. These exercises construct alternative probable scenarios and tease out policy prescriptions for each scenario. For example, what if the pandemic persists and the world enters into a trusting cooperative mode? What if it enters into a mode in which every country erects walls and assumes protectionist stance? What if poverty increases globally and domestic unrest swells in countries across the globe? What if lockdowns are imposed intermittently and work patterns are disrupted, educational rhythms are interrupted, health outcomes are adversely affected, jobs in high contact sectors do not return, so on and so forth. Construction of such scenarios for India is necessary so that we are not caught off guard when a scenario materializes. Somehow, we seem to be operating under the unstated impression that the world is going to return to the pre-pandemic homeostasis. And everything is going to be the old normal. Our travel, education, entertainment, shopping, gatherings, offices, sports, etc. But this looks very unlikely. And what are the implications of a new scenario? For example, for the children's education, their classroom experience, their learning levels, their mental health, digital access, parental participation and guidance, teacher effectiveness and a host of other things. What are the implications for work, office as well as factory shop floor, in agriculture, in the diversified service sector? How much of the current labor force in the country is likely to be redundant? What are the retraining requirements and their costs? The list is long, very long. What are the implications of our experience of the pandemic for public policy? It taught us that national defense is no longer limited to securing our borders. It told us that a calamity like this, unlike an earthquake, a cyclone, a flood, is not restricted geographically so that the rest of the country or the world can come to the rescue of that area. Every geography, every sector, every household and indeed every human body is a theatre of war. If living conditions of the poor are not improved, rich people in their gated communities will not be safe. This realization has implications for political, economic, social cultural policies. We need to map them. A robust, clear-eyed social science will have to spring into action. While scientists stare at petri dishes in their labs, social scientists will have to undertake a rigorous study of society and come up with alternative action plans. On the lines of, if A, then B. If C, then D. If E, then F. We cannot afford to grope for guidance when we are face to face with the challenge and get pushed into one option or the other without thinking through. We need to map out scenarios and plans to navigate into those scenarios. Many governments, companies, think tanks, universities, consulting firms have been on this job since the outbreak of the pandemic from as early as March 2020. I have given links to some studies in the description section. Spare some time and flip through them. We cannot be clueless about the likely scenarios. We cannot afford to muddle through. That's not what a nation with superpower ambitions does. The hope that 
The pandemic will end soon has encouraged the center to mess with the way it dealt with the crisis. The egocratic center saw an opportunity to take the entire credit. In fact, it took the credit when there was lull and the first wave passed. The PM told the international community that India has conquered the pandemic. The ruling party has passed a resolution congratulating the Prime Minister for defeating the coronavirus. The government saw no need to consult the states or experts. In fact, it probably was reluctant because any consultation or partnership would have inevitably meant sharing the credit with them. The setting up of task forces was a token rather than a serious initiative. Their non-functioning goes to prove it. The economic stimulus was essentially a repackaging of existing allocations and was half-hearted. The government failed to treat lockdown as a stopgap and utilize the period to strengthen COVID-related medical infrastructure. While every major country began investing in vaccine production and making at-risk purchases, our government was busy in self-congratulation. When questions arose about the shortage of vaccines, their unfair differential pricing, sluggish and falling rate of vaccination, it resorted to gaslighting the states and opposition parties. Mounting deaths, rising caseload, scarcity of oxygen, ICU beds, and overall breakdown of medical infrastructure only pushed the government into denial. The states were told to go into do-it-yourself mode in vaccination procurement, imposition or lifting of lockdown and restrictions. Dead bodies floating in the Ganga failed to move the conscience of our government leaders. In the face of mounting public criticism and tough questioning about the indefensible differential pricing from the Supreme Court, the Prime Minister has announced a reversal of policy on Monday. Now, the centre would procure the vaccines and give to states free of cost. A welcome course correction, but a tad late. Economy has contracted. 2020-2021 GDP growth was minus 7.3%. Unemployment is growing. CMI data show that from 8% in 2020 April, it has climbed to 14.7% as of week ending 23rd May. Urban unemployment is 12.7%. Rural unemployment saw a sharp rise in May. It was 6.2% in the first week of April. It is 9.7% now. More than 1.5 crore jobs were lost in May alone. Labour participation is on the decline. CMIE estimated that 90% of the households in the country saw a decline in their income. Consequently, household consumption has declined. Reserve Bank of India admitted that there was a demand shock. Azim Premji University research estimated that 23 crore people have joined the ranks of poor because of COVID. Index of consumer sentiment is diving southward precipitously. In April this year, it was 54.4. Currently, it is 48.8, according to CMIE. Yet, the government is unable to give evidence that it has a concrete plan to address the decline, other than expressing optimism that things will turn around. Can the nation ever forget the gory scenes of mass funerals in the crematoriums? Will it forget thousands of migrant workers walking hundreds of miles uncared for? Every aspect of handling the pandemic is messed up, without exception. In the face of an unprecedented menace, the ruling dispensation embraced obscurantism, dressed up as tradition and national pride. Union Health Minister and another senior cabinet minister endorsed an untested drug launched by a yoga guru. A false claim was made in their presence that the drug could cure COVID 
in seven days and that it had WHO approval. WHO quickly called out the fake claim. And about 10 days ago, this yoga guru said that allopathy was stupid science and thousands of doctors who took two jabs of vaccine also died of COVID. While scientists stared at the pathogen in the labs, several ruling party leaders and legislators saw the COVID health crisis as an occasion to proclaim their reverence for the cow. They prescribed cow dung and cow urine as sure cures for COVID infection. We saw video footage of many people daubing their bodies with cow dung and leaders telling the people about the precise dosage of urine to drink to combat the virus. A BJP MLA from Uttar Pradesh claimed that drinking cow urine protected from coronavirus. He specified that one should mix 50 ml of cow urine with 100 ml of water. A BJP MP from Madhya Pradesh announced that she took cow urine every day. She claimed that I do not have to take any medicine and I don't have corona. In the past, she even claimed that a mix of cow urine and other cow products cured her of cancer. A BJP MLA in Assam told the state assembly that Gaumutra and Gobar could fight coronavirus. Several news reports from the state of Gujarat informed us and showed us pictures of mass cow dung baths organized there. Madhya Pradesh culture minister suggested that Yajna Chikitsa could prevent the third wave of Corona. She advised people that they should perform Yajna to purify the environment to stop the spread of the virus. The same MP who claimed that cow urine had cured her of cancer told people to chant Hanuman Chalisa every day at 7 p.m. To eradicate the virus. A union minister announced that eating Bhabiji papad would produce antibodies that could fight coronavirus. A BJP leader in Meerut went about the streets in rickshaw, blowing conch and chanting Jai Sri Ram and Har Har Mahadev to arrest the menace of the virus. He claimed that the sound of conch and the chants will add to the oxygen concentration in the air. A senior most MLA in Madhya Pradesh belonging to the BJP claimed that building of Ram temple in Ayodhya would bring an end to COVID. A senior national secretary of the BJP has said that no virus could harm a country that had 33 crore gods. The Uttarakhand chief minister dismissed concerns that Kumb could be a risk. He said, Kumb is at the bank of the river Ganga. Ma Ganga's blessings are there in the flow. So, there should be no corona. President of the Hindu Mahasabha said, a person who chants Om Namah Shivaya and applies cow dung on his body will be saved. He also raised the concern that foreign-made corona vaccines and medicines could contain cow blood and demanded that the pharma companies should clarify on this before bringing their drugs into India. You must have come across these reports on and off in bits and pieces. I thought it is important to bring all these doses of wisdom together to underline the obscurantism that has gripped the ruling political dispensation from top to bottom. Imagine the power and influence these utterances acquired as they went viral on several social media platforms. Our Prime Minister's call last year to switch off electricity and light lamps on April 5th at 9 o'clock in the night for 9 minutes was also seen as pregnant with deeper magical import in fighting coronavirus. His earlier assertions that ancient India knew plastic surgery and even stem cell research lent strength to this kind of obscurantist narrative. This shamanic worldview colored the governments and the ruling establishments assessment 
of the challenge that COVID-19 posed to the country. It led to a gross underestimation of the challenge and overestimation of our exceptionalism, presaging an assault on scientific temper and a rabid assertion of obscurantism. The assertion was calculated. If the virus passed off lightly as they hoped, the obscurantist narrative could be reinforced. But sadly, that was not to be. This has cost us dearly, both lives and livelihoods. We can no longer afford to be mired in an obscurantist past with a shamanic worldview. We can't anymore mess with our present. And we cannot be muddle-headed about our future way forward in a post-pandemic era. These are the bigger course corrections that await our government's attention. I think I've taken a little longer today. I will stop now. We'll be back again next week, Wednesday, lunchtime at 1 o'clock. Do stay safe. Take good care of yourselves and all your dear ones. Until then, bye.